Okay, so we learned that Japan burned, bombed Pearl Harbor um, in a surprise attack. It brought us into the war. Um, so now, now that America is in the war, what happens? Well, there's a lot of things that happen once America gets into the war. Um, first off, our economy changes. Um, we create a whole bunch of agencies to oversee the production of war materials and factories. Remember, we were sitting in the Great Depressions with factories that were just sitting empty. Um, there wasn't a lot to do, so we had to get those factories up to speed. We had to have somebody oversee the war production in those factories. So we created agencies to do that. Um, the government also stepped in and said, listen, we're not going to price gouge. Um, price gouging means that your supply is so high or your demand is so high for something that people were charging ridiculous amounts of money. Um, use a PlayStation 5, for example. Um, nobody can get a hold of them for $500. But those who have bought those PlayStation 5s are now selling them for $800, $900, $1,000 because they can. Um, so the government stepped in and said, we're not going to do any of that during the wartime. Um, we're going to make sure prices stay the same. And we are going to ration some supplies. So, you know, gunpowder, um, things that you need, you know, steel, things to make war materials. They rationed them. So instead of giving it to the public, they now went to the factories to make these war materials that we would need. Um, we also spent a lot of money. Um, spent $330 billion in income taxes. Um or no, we didn't spend that in income taxes. We spent $330 billion on the war. Um, so we increased income taxes and we sold war bonds. Um, and if you're not familiar with war bonds, that's basically you're saying, here, government, take my take my money and then they will double it in a certain amount of years. It could be 10 years, 15, 30 years, depending on how, how long you buy the war bond for it. Um, they generally don't sell those that much anymore. Um, I don't even know if you can get those. I think the last time I saw a war bond was my grandparents gave them to me and for like my birthday when I was 10. So you're talking 1990. Um, but they may still sell war bonds. I mean, it's a possibility. Um, so if next time you go to the bank, ask them, say, Hey, do you still sell war bonds? And they'll be able to tell you. Um, but that's just basically a way you give the money to the government. The government doubles it in a certain amount of time. All right. So what other changes were civil liberties? Okay. So no laws were passed to restrict freedom of speech or press. Okay. So that was very, very important. So our constitutional rights were not infringed upon. Um, however, after Pearl Harbor, Japanese Americans were feared and we forced and put them in inter intermittent camps, okay? Um, it's not the same thing as a concentration camp, but it was a place where Americans, the government was afraid of Japanese Americans of being overthrown from the inside. So Japan surprise attacked us. So we looked at Japanese Americans, even though they were here in the United States, they were still Japanese citizens. Uh, some people were actually American citizens um, that were Japanese Americans. And they were forced to move to a location so that the way the United States government could keep an eye on them. And that way, that way nobody was able to take down the government from the inside or do something on our homeland for Japan. Um, I don't think this was right. I, I don't think we should have put people in, in camps. Um, we didn't kill anybody, but I still don't think we should have uprooted Japanese Americans and moved them into camps just because we were afraid. Um, but 1940s, the world's changed since 1940. That's 80 years ago. So what we believe today is not what people thought back then. Okay, so the cool thing about the United States is that we were always trying to advance human engineering. We were always trying to make things better with inventions. And one of the things that we did was 
we came up with new technology and secret codes, okay? Um, but it wasn't just America. It was also Germany, okay? Um, you guys might recognize this guy. This guy is Albert Einstein, right? Um, we were trying to race with Germany to build the most advanced weapons and use secret codes because if you use the secret code, you could not have you didn't have to worry about the enemy knowing where you were knowing what your plans were um because obviously the technology wasn't available to hide messages like using a secure channel or you know things like that that wasn't available so everybody heard your broadcast so everybody heard what you were telling your troops or your ships or your submarines um so you had to use code and you wanted to make sure that that code was never broken um so we're gonna i'll talk about albert einstein here in a little bit um but that code was the most important thing um and we're gonna get into that uh but first i i teased yesterday how the biggest project was the most secretive project um, Albert Einstein came from Germany, like I told you yesterday, um, and he informed President Roosevelt that the Germans may be working on an atomic bomb. Um, at that point, the United States started going into trying to figure out how to build an atomic bomb, and we called it the Manhattan Project. And President Roosevelt didn't let everybody know about this project, so much so the vice president didn't even know about the project. So there were only a handful of people that knew uh, because we had to keep it a secret because if you let this out and the plans on how to build it or how to do it and how to make an atomic bomb got into the wrong hands, it could be devastating to the world um, because I can almost guarantee you that if Adolf Hitler had a nuclear bomb, he would have used it. Um, so this was very, very important and I'm trying to keep it a secret. All right. So now let's talk about some secret codes. Like I said, both sides use secret codes. Um, the Germans used a code machine called the Enigma machine. They thought it was unbreakable, okay? And the way this machine worked was it was it had three wheels at the top. This one has actually more than three wheels. But it had three wheels at the top, and it said whatever setting you'd want to put it on. So if you would type an S... The S would be any letter on the keyboard except for an S. Um, and the only way that you'd be able to decipher the code, meaning read what it says, is if you knew what to turn the dials to, the key, to tell you what the S actually meant. Um, and it changed every 24 hours. So it changed every day. So if you were trying to break this code, you could never... You had to do it within 24 hours because the next day, that code changed again. The key changed. Um, eventually, a British mathema mathematician broke the Enigma code with the world's first computer, helped shorten the war. Um, the thing about this Enigma machine, that is, it has that many combinations. And you might be saying, how many combinations that is? Well, I don't even, I can't even tell you because this is thousands, this is hundreds thousands, millions, billions, trillions. And then you got two more commas after trillions. So it has that many combinations. So it was almost impossible to break. And like I said, we Germany changed the key every day and the Allies only had 24 hours to code it. Um, the messages were sent by Morse code. Uh, but British Britain also found a machine and a key book on the U-boat. So... Having the machine and having the key book kind of allowed Great Britain to help break the code because now at this point you have the machine and you have the key book so you can start working with the working on figuring out how it worked. Um, but there was two flaws in the Ignim machine that that Germany did um, with their Morse codes. So this is an unbreakable machine. But what Germany did was it started, they started the transmission the same way every day. So every day they would say weather report or whatever it would be at the top. 
um, it would say weather report at the top every single day. And every single day, that weather report code would be decrypted. So it didn't really say weather report. It might just have some string of letters. Um, and then the other flaw was a letter cannot be used to encrypt itself. Like I said, so if you type an S, an S cannot be represented by an S. An S would have to be represented by a different key or a different letter. So those were the two flaws. Um, so the British, like I said, the British mathematician was the first to break a three-letter code, created a computer named BOM to decode the messages. Um, it, it was, it's a very, very big machine. Uh, but then Germany's like, well, you broke the three-letter code. We're going to create a four-letter code. Um, so that way there's even more combinations. And once Germany did that, that computer that Great Britain had could no longer decipher the code. So in comes Americans. Um, Joseph Dush grew up in Dayton, Ohio. Uh, he worked on a top secret program here in Ohio. Uh, and he was the one who broke Germany's four-letter code. And then after that, it was the Americans. We decoded most of Germany's messages during the war after, after uh, his successful decoding of the of the enigma code um so that was kind of cool that he actually did something in dayton ohio we have an ohioan who played a big big major role in in uh the war there are also ohioans that performed in the war well every ohioan performed in the war spectacularly but there are some there's some ties to ohio with the nuclear bomb that we'll, i'll talk about more coming up um so now America was able to decipher Germany's code, but America and the Allies needed to find a way to decipher or to, to mix up their codes. So they needed their own Enigma machine, something where Germany couldn't figure out what they were doing. So they turned to a group of Native Americans uh, and they were called code talkers. Okay. And these Native Americans were basically. They they won the war. They were part of winning the war for the United States. I don't want to say they won the war by themselves, but they played a major, major, major role in winning the war for the Allies. Um, they used their own language. So there was only 30 people who knew the language. So now you're talking about only 30 people who would be able to decipher a code back and forth between these people who were talking. Um, it did not have a written alphabet, and they actually were Comanche. Comanche uh, Native Americans. Um, they did not have a written alphabet, uh, and they could send messages much quicker than code machines, obviously, right? Um, you could talk faster than what you could type, or you could talk faster than what a computer can print something out. So code talkers was a very important part. Um, and then for the end of today, what I'm going to do is I'm going to play this video, and then I'm going to also put it in the modules just in case you didn't, in case this doesn't work. <laughs> But you do need to watch this video um, that I'm going to put in the modules. So watch this video, and then for your homework today, I'm actually not going to play this because I don't know how well it will work. But for your homework for today, this is what I want you to do. I want you to... Um, I can get... There we go. I want you to read The War at Home and do your self-check 5.4. And then for tomorrow, we will pick up on... Uh, we will pick up the major battles in the war and how the war eventually ended in Europe and in, in Japan. All right, guys. I will see everybody tomorrow. Bye-bye, guys.